Hey, um, welcome back. This is session three of um, the book of Ruth, going through the prophecy of Ruth. And um, if you're in Bible study with me during the week, then this is just for you if you wanted to go back through and catch a couple of resources that um, maybe I went through too quickly or um, because those that are in Bible study with me know that my brain kind of works like a squirrel's brain, that I'm like, oh, did you know this? And I jump around all over the place. So um, I try to do the videos for those that are in Bible study with me so that you can go back over what we've covered, um, as well as the, for those that are learning via the internet with us, that you can also get into this. The whole goal of this is that you are um, pushed forward to research, to rely on the Holy Spirit who is in it within you, and to go and see for yourself, okay? Um, if you disagree with me on certain teachings or things, how I see the scripture, that's okay. We are not divided in that. I just want to encourage you that go back to the word, speak to the Holy Spirit, and allow a, um, a humble position to come in front of the Lord and ask the Lord, speak to me. Let this living word come inside of me and change me. And that every time you get an opportunity to find something in the Bible where you're like, I don't understand that, realize it is a grand and amazing opportunity for your life, for the Holy Spirit to be invited to come in and to teach you and I um, in these things. So we are going to pick up and we are going to make it through um, Ruth 1, 6 through verse 22. And I know you're thinking, there's no way we're going to make it through that much information. But we really are today. That's or maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> That's what I hope we're going to do um, and um, kind of get through this. As we do this, remember that we've we've already been through the background of Ruth and we've been through that we are looking at Ruth for the prophecy of Ruth this time. You can look through Ruth and find so many things that are personally applicable right now, but realize that I am more looking at an overarching theme of the prophecy of what the story means. When I say that, remember that um, in your notes, we see Naomi as Israel, Ruth, as the coming in of the church, um, Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, um, and several other things we're going to see as we get into this. Today, we will look heavily at Naomi for um, this beginning part is says a lot about her. And then we will wrap up by looking at Ruth. We will also look at Orpah. Orpah will represent in this the Gentiles who... Um, hear but do not receive okay so um you'll see that in orpa so we're going to get started i want you to stop the video right now and read for yourself chapter 1 6 through 22 so i don't just have to read it to you um if you can't read find someone that can help you read right um but i go ahead and stop the video and go ahead and read no, okay, so you should be back with me, and we're just going to go on the, the concept that you have read now 6 through 22, and we're going to work straight from that. So by now, you know that this is after Elimelech has died, um, and then um, Kilion and Malon have died. Um, some people say, or some of the studies say that they were twins because they're both named unhealthy and wasting away. Um, they have died, and now we have Naomi. She is left in this very Job-like situation where she has no husband, no inheritance, and she has these two Gentile women who was illegal by the law for her sons to marry to begin with. Um, we, find, we, we looked at that last time because they were Moabites, and we see that she is now rising up. She arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. So let's break down a couple things here to realize this was disobedience. Elimelech and Naomi left the house of bread and, and went to a foreign land that were worshipped idols in order to find provision. It was disobedience that they left. And now Naomi has been left without a husband. Remember that in 
um, book of Revelation, the woman who rides the beast mocks Israel by saying, I am no widow, Re- kind of mocking them saying, you have lost your husband. Um, you, you were supposed to be married to God, right? But you have lost him. She also has no sons. So there is no inheritance for her. So we see a picture of Naomi, I would say in verse six, as she is ready to return from her sojourning, ready to return from the land that she was not supposed to be in, that she had been scattered out in. And she returns as the remnant. The Bible talks over and over about this remnant. Um, You see it um, constantly. Um, If you look at Isaiah 10, and we can jump there really fast. Um, it talks about this remnant that will return. So go, jump with me to Isaiah 10. Doo, doo, doo. Okay. And um, 19. Let's look at 19. So, or 18. Start there. Isaiah 10, 18. The glory of his forest and of his fruitful land, the Lord will destroy both soul and body. And it will be as when a sick man wastes away. But the remnant of the trees of his forest will be so few that a child can write them down. So you see that God and God's this is one of so many verses where God says, I will destroy you, O Israel, but I will not destroy you completely. There will be a remnant. There is always a remnant for Israel. And I believe at the beginning of verse six, we are seeing this prophecy acted out, if you will, through Naomi. She is returning only a remnant of what she was when she went out. When she went out, she had a husband. She had security. She had children and an inheritance and the hope of great things. But when she comes in, she is broken. As we're going to find out, she is a remnant of what have, should have come in. Uh, so few that a children can count it. And I hope you can see where we're going with this. Um, so that the Lord visited the people and get them food. She's heard that the Lord has um, stopped the famine, that there's food back in Israel. So she's heading home. So you see this section when Naomi says this big, great, beautiful, very Jewish speech. Um, But Naomi said to her daughters, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you. Remember, I told you in the last session that this word kindly is hesed, God's hesed. It's C-H-E-S-E-D. It means God's loving kindness or his faithfulness to people. It's used three times in this book. This is the first time we see reference to God's hesed. And she, Naomi is saying, I hope it goes with you, Ruth and Orpah, as you leave. She's blessing them. But the funny thing is, it says, as you have dealt with the dead, right, her husband and sons, and with me, the Lord grant you that you will find rest, each of you, in the house of your husband. She's saying, remarry, go. But when we physically, this makes sense. They are widows in a time when there is not much provisions at very little provision outside of Israel. At least Israel gave provision, as we're going to see in the law of gleaning and the law of the sojourner in this story. But outside of it, very little provision. God in in Judaism and in Christianity always makes a place for the widow and the orphan and the sojourner. Those who cannot take care of himself, he always has a place for them and a, a means of provision. And this story just lays out the beauty of that perfectly, that he does not want to leave the widow or the orphan. Um, We're even told in James that, you know, pure and undefiled religion is to go to the widow, to go to the orphan in their distress. So this is a, this is an issue very close to God's heart. But the funny thing, I guess, or a better word is ironic thing I want to point out to you is that in Naomi's moment, when she's spilling out her guts and saying, I hope God's hesed goes with you. It is a problem. And and hear me on this. She knows Yahweh. She worships the one and only true God. Her entire culture is surrounded by this. And yet she is saying, because of our physical problems, it is better spiritually for you to go back to your father's house that worship idols into a land that does not know Yahweh and die in that than it is to go with me. But I hope God's hesed goes with you. Um, 
to, you see this being a setting up what the depth of what Ruth is going to decide. You also see Orpah here because then she kissed she kissed them and they they together lifted up their voices and wept. And they again, Orpah and Ruth said to her, "No, we will return with you to your people." And I want to tell you, um, we were talking about this in Bible study, that, you know, Ruth is clearly saying, no, we're going with you. And you could almost hear Orpah's voice. And I'm, um, I'm adding in a little here that you can almost hear Orpah's voice going, no, I'm going to go with you. You know, like, um, Ruth's going, I'm going to go with you too. Yeah, we're going to go. So because... Orpa doesn't stay, right? If you jump to 15, it says, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should return as well, right? So I mean, you hear that Orpa saying this here, but it is a lip service because she's not going to stay. Um, I think there's a deep truth in that as we will discuss later on um, about true salvation versus lip service. Um, because when it gets hard, when the physical needs come in, Orpah's gone. Um, and remember, Orpah in this book is going to represent the side of the Gentiles that do not have ears to hear, those who will not receive and believe. And so I feel like here, Ruth is saying, no, we are going with you. And she has this beautiful moment. But then Orpah's like, no, I'm going to go with you, no. You know, like in the Stuart voice or something. So let's keep going. No, we will return with you. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I sons in my womb that I may become your husband? Hear what, as I read this part for you. Hear that Naomi gives a speech to Ruth and Orpah in a negative tone, right? She's kind of spitting this stuff out. It's the truth as she sees it. But I want you to actually stop and realize that Naomi is prophesying out of her mouth right now because everything she questions is actually the summary of the book of Ruth. Do you grab that? Listen to it. Turn back, daughters. Why would you go with me? Have I sons in my womb that I may make, um, become your husband's? Turn back, daughters, go your way. I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should say I have a husband this very night, right? And should bear sons, you're going to wait till they grow up? Would you therefore refrain from marrying anyone else? No, daughters, it's exceedingly bitter for me that for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So you I want you to realize that this is almost her prophesying what this book is going to be about. Um, one is she recognizes that it is the, the hand of the Lord going against her. But what she doesn't see, she sees the negative. She sees God is against me, right? And a lot of times we feel like that in life. Things are bad. God must be punishing me. It's going bad. What she does not see is that through hardship, through deep, deep hurt, God is drawing her nearer to redemption. And hear me in this. It is not only for Naomi's sake that this hardship has come, but for Ruth's as well. For he is going to redeem not only those that follow the law, or in this case should, but don't, but he is going to also redeem through grace the Moabite people that have been excommunicated because of their beginning and because of their actions. So I want you to hear that this is actually prophecy because she basically says, have I sons in my womb? Basically, can I give you a husband? Um, she's referring to a thing called the Leverite marriage. And um, you can look at Genesis 38. There's several places but um, it's where it's named and laid out. But she's referring to the Leverite marriage, which is the concept that if my husband died and um, I did not have children, then I would marry my husband's brother and he would by obligation have to give me a child. Because you see, God is providing for the woman, even this far back. It's, it's about the seed and the continu continuation of the lineage, but it's also about the woman because she was destitute at that point. And so he instills um, at that point the best 
like kind of situation that can help her that she's not just abandoned to starve to death because she cannot work. She has no inheritance. She has no place in society without a husband and without a man. And so God in his kindness is dealing with her. It makes it awkward as we discussed at Thanksgiving dinner because you're like looking, maybe you're looking at your husband's brothers and you're thinking, oh, please don't die right now. I'm <laughs> just playing. Or, or maybe, you know, so it, I'm not going to go down that, that path, but you see that this is really important to God, um, the Leverite marriage. And that's what she's referring to. Like she's saying, even if I could birth another son that could honor the first son's um, marriage to you and give you a child, I'm too old. Time has passed for me. I want you to remember that time, I believe, is important in this story because this right here is God does not work in linear time. I'm not sorry. He's not. I, I said that wrong. God is not bound. There you go. He works within linear time, but he is not bound by linear time. That is when you see a miracle. What she says right here is I'm too old. Time has passed me by. I'm washed up. It's over for me. There's no redemption. There's no time left for me. And I want to tell you, this miracle that occurs in this book is as amazing as Jesus walking on water because it defines physical properties of this earth. It shows us that God is beyond the physical properties that he himself created. So should we walk on water or should we be able to? Well, no, the physical, like we know we can't walk on water. Trust me, every little kid has tried when they read that story. Um, and um, Jesus did it because he's outside of the laws that define this earth. Right here, this story shows us that God is also outside of the physical property of time. Because she is saying, I'm too old, how is it going to work? Before she even had a need, he had already provided, outside of her timeline, he had provided a kinsman redeemer that will come in. And by the end of this, she will have a baby, Naomi will. And what is she saying right here? Have I sons in my womb? No, I'm too old. There's no way. And yet jump to chapter four and it's 17, 417. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Realize that God is working a miracle here. She herself is prophesying, though she doesn't even realize what she's saying, because God has already worked outside of time a redemption plan for this woman who's too old in her mind to have any kind of redemption coming her way. I want to tell you, as we get into this, um, I'll go back to, I got to get myself organized. So in the Bible study, we went through deeply Naomi's role in this. So I'm going to focus right now on Naomi. I'll come back to Orpah and um, my family keeps texting me, stop it. Um, I'll come back to Orpah and to Ruth because she is, um, I'm part of the church. I'm not Jewish. And so um, we'll come back to her last and look at her. But right now I want you to focus in on Naomi and, and the prophecy of these verses. So you see that she's coming back from being scattered um, across the land. And you see that um, she, I had to text these people and say, please stop texting Because they keep texting me. I'm like, stop it in the middle of this. Okay. Um, I haven't figured out how to edit. There's that. Okay. So if anybody knows how to edit videos, come be my friend so that you can help me edit things because I really have not figured out how to do that. Um, okay. So back to Naomi. We're going to focus on Naomi for a minute. I believe that Naomi is a picture here of Israel after um, 70 AD, after they have um, denied the um, Messiah or rejected the Messiah of Jesus Christ, and after 70 AD. 
a little backstory. Um, the temple falls finally in 70 AD. Jesus prophesies that this is coming in the book of Matthew. He weeps over the event. And the Jews do not get their land back until 1948. That's shy of 2,000 years. Um, 1800 roughly um, years that they don't have their land, that they are pushed out to scattered across the earth. And it is rough, rough timing. I want you to um, l realize that part of, and we've talked about this, that there are several laws in this book that are being covered. But Naomi, a very important here, is the law of redemption. And that right here, Naomi is coming back into the land that she has lost. In 70 AD, they lost the land. So she's coming back. Jump with me over into 19. So we're going to skip Ruth's little section for a minute. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. So they're coming back into Bethlehem, the place where David will be born and the place where, um, right, so because of this, because Ruth is David's great grandmother. And the woman said, is this Naomi? They can't even barely recognize her. She says to them, do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity down upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. There's one thing I want to point in here, is that the beginning is, Naomi says, Call me Mara, for I am bitter. She also says, I went away full, but I'm utterly empty now. But the, the scripture is telling us something beautiful here, and I don't want you to miss this. And they came to Bethlehem. They came to the house of bread at the beginning of the barley harvest. That's the beginning of Passover, right? So I want you to, to realize that she says, I'm empty. But the scripture is saying, but you're coming into the house of bread, Naomi, and you're coming when? At the time of harvest. This is such a deep spiritual truth about the word that we come to Jesus often or come to the Lord at our most utter broken state. And often we say, this is it, God. This is all I am. I am broken. I am ugly. I'm disgusting. This is it. I've made a mess of it. I am empty. And Jesus reaches down and that level of despair. And he doesn't say, oh, that's not true, right? He says, yes, this is where you are. I accept you. And I'm pulling you in to me because I am the bread of life. Come to the house of bread for it's harvest time. I mean, really understand that truth. Naomi thinks this is the end of her story. And you see this over and over in the Bible and you see this over and over in life. This is the beginning. When she has lost her husband, her children, she is at the utter state of brokenness. The harvest is coming, right? So I want to tell you the prophecy that I see in this, that the word is, is um, laying out here. She says, call me Mara. I heard tell one time that um, they thought that that was cheap of her to say um, because at least you had, like she was pouting. And um, it's not pouting. Please understand this is prophecy. Because the Jews, they left in 70 AD. They, that's when they finally lost the land for good. They did not come in until 1948. And if any of us have been through any history, they're coming in from the Holocaust. This, I believe, is a prophetic statement about when they would be ingathered back into Israel. Call me Mara, for I am bitter. The Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. You can almost see the pictures of the Holocaust that led up to Israel being allowed to being reborn as a nation. Jump with me to Ezekiel, and I would like to show you something that you maybe have not viewed in this light. You know the story probably if you grew up in Ezekiel 38 is where we're going. Um, 
you've probably heard the story, but I want you with this image of her saying, call me Mara, right? Where she gets the word from Exodus 15 when they drank the water and it was bitter and they grumbled against God, which is the constant um, issue with the Israelites and God. Um, he provides, they grumble. It's just this back and forth dance that the church also um, has a dance card with the Lord on. But I want you to read, I'm going to read with you, actually, is um, Ezekiel 37. This is the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, remember, when we talk about prophecy, we often think that prophecy means a statement is made and then it's happened and it's over. Okay, that is very linear and it's not how the Bible um, operates with prophecy. Prophecy is patterns. The best way I think about it in my head to understand it, my little pea head, right, is that, um, you know, those diggers, uh, excavators, is that what it's called? Those things, right? Yeah. Um, that might be wrong, but I feel like that's what it's called. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not into that. Um, so, the first time it digs into the earth, it might reveal a couple of things, right? But the second time it digs into the earth, it reveals even more. And then the third time, maybe it reveals the whole thing. And that is the way prophecy is. It's done in patterns. It digs and hits some of it. It digs and hits again. It digs until all is done, all right? All of it is completed and the fulfillment of the prophecy comes. So Ezekiel 37 People, it, it, it refers to several refers to several things, but specifically, I'm going to read this to you with Call Me Mara, with Naomi re-entering Israel, with the Jews from the Holocaust um, coming back to Israel. So then he said to me, "Prophesy over these bones, and I and say to them, O oh, dry bones." Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and you will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So as I prophesy, as I was commanded and I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone on bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. If you know the pictures of those Holocaust vis victims, you can see this in your mind perfectly. Bones rattling on bones, barely flesh upon them, but there's no breath. In those pictures, they are such a broken people. It gets me like it's so broken and that God is saying, but I'm going to put life in you now. You may be standing, but you're like the walking dead. So I looked at them and behold, there were sinews on them. But there was no breath in them. And he came to me, prophesy to the breath. I love that. Prophesy, son of man, and say to breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. We know that when Jesus meets them in the upper room after he is risen and he's afraid, what does he do? He breathes on the disciples, which I always thought was so weird for God to just be going on them but he was using the same word in Greek as in Hebrew that is in the beginning of Genesis that says God blew life into them he is literally the breath of life and so here he is breathing life back into them so I prophesy as he commanded and the breath came in them and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army I want to tell you that Israel has one of the best armies in the world and that they've only been a country since 19 48. It is amazing feat. So jump down now to 12. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will, I will place you in your own land. If you go on in this, it jumps to 21. 
Behold, I will take you, the people of Israel, from the nations among which you have gone. The, the Jews were spread all over the world after 70 AD. And will gather them from all over and bring them to their own land. You see, God is going to have and will still redeem their land. We are told that it's not for their sake, but because God said he would, for his own glory, he will redeem their land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountain of Israel. I want to tell you that that is something that has happened since 1948. They don't live separated by tribes. They are the nation of Israel. But after this verse, um, when you get into 22 through 27, this becomes now prophecy for things that have not come yet. This is future prophecy for millennial reign, when the servant David shall be king over them. And if you're asking, how will David be king over them? Go look at Revelation 21 and realize that's the first resurrection and that David will be back to and um, Jesus as well. So that's the millennial reign time. But I want to show you, this is prophesying how Israel would come back to get their land this far back. And that when Ruth says, call me Mara, she is not pouting or saying anything negative. She is prophesying the bitterness, the um, disparity that the Jews would enter back in. Um, you can also look at, there's a, um, Leviticus 26. Okay, so I'm going to go into right now, kind of go a little bit deeper for you into this law of redemption, because you might be thinking, why the land, right? Um, we have been sadly taught um, in the church, a man named Origen, who is an old church father, started a concept called replacement theology. It's also called fulfillment theology. I want to tell you that um, I struggle so deeply with um, believing this theology because if you believe that, then it is a struggle to understand the word. Um, and you have to just continuously go with Origen's thoughts. So Origen came up and said, the word isn't literal. It is um, spoken parables and it, it is something secret. It's always hiding behind it, right? Okay. We know that that does exist in the Bible, but several types of literary um um, several different things are used, right, to produce this word. Um, you have poetry in here. You have parables in here. You have, there's just so much in here. But you cannot come at this and say all of it, right, is, um, all of it is figurative. When you get into that, you have people that don't believe that Jonah was really swallowed by a whale. And then you're like, well, I don't really know if I believe in creation anymore. It just starts breaking the sucker down. And then I want to tell you, why did Jesus like hit so heavily on this scripture? Because this is literally the word of God given to us. And if we start down that path, we start breaking it around. And I, and I honestly say, well, throw the thing out. Because um, if one little bit of it's not true, that it's not true. And um, right, like if you want to theorize that way up high, it makes sense. If you want to get in this thing and start breaking it down, it falls apart because you the whole thing has to be true beginning to end. So replacement theology came in with origin. Um, then you had um, several people support it and back it up. You had people saying, well, um, the Jews are guilty for the ones who um, crucified Jesus. You, um, Augustine actually believed that. And that that's why things are going bad for them, right? That they were the ones that killed God. Um, now, the, the truth side of it was that they did reject the Messiah and were going through a time of discipline, of hardship, like Naomi leaving the promised land and having to sojourn out, but it did not mean that he was done with them and that the church replaced Israel. And so they say every time you see Israel, you should think the church. Um, that does not work. Um, Martin Luther actually believed this. I'm not downing these people. I understand they lived at a certain time. 
um, and that Luther was just, remember, Luther was a man, and he was just one step forward, and he was the vessel used for the Reformation, but there had to be a lot of change that came about. Um, Luther was not the be-all and end-all, right? He was just a willing vessel, and so Luther writes some really damaging, really anti-Semitic literature, and um, the Nazis come in, and they use his writing to support the final solution, um, which is just sad. And um, Luther was a man and clearly um, had a racist bent. And, and, I, and I don't mean that too heavy, heavy handed. I'm not trying to make Luther something he wasn't or to, to like he still had sin in his life. But I also see that he was did a great thing for the church. So please don't freak out about it. But um, Jesus is the only one that hasn't sinned, okay? So um, so we see that the Nazis use this. And then you get to Dachau, um, the concentration camps. And when the Jews are coming out of the cattle cars, they see a sign up that says, you killed God. Work off your punishment, basically. This replacement theology is so dangerous because it leads to this. It leads to they're bad, we're good. The Crusaders, when they entered Jerusalem, there were 300,000 Jewish families living there at that time. By the end, there's 1,000. The Crusaders saw it as their point to get rid of the Jews. It is still an issue to this day. I sat by a man um, for a really long plane ride from Russia, and he um, made the comment that um, he hates the Jews and was sad that, that Germany did not finish the job. I literally almost fell out of my seat. I could not believe that this thought is out there, but I have to tell you, it is still a very predominant thought. And the Jews suffer to this day, great, great injustices. Um, and I have to tell you, the church has not done a good job with the relationship with Israel. Um, I think that you, um, we just, we miss it. And replacement theology did nothing good for that. So replacement theology says that we replaced them, right? We're now the chosen people, they're out. If that's true, please go read Romans 11 because we got us the problem with Romans 11 then because we are grafted into the tree. If it fails, as Paul says, we fail. If they get ousted and there, there's no redemption for Naomi, if this is just it, she's got no husband and no inheritance and she's going to stay like this, then don't read on. If that's what you believe, don't read chapter three or four because you're not going to want to see that the kinsman redeemer comes to redeem not only Ruth, but Naomi and the land. So this is an important thing. I want you to jump to Levit Leviticus for me. How long am I going? Okay, I know. You can shut me off if it gets too long. Come back later <laughs> when you're like, I can, can't handle anymore. Leviticus, after 23, when it lays out the feast, um, which you might want to look at because this is happening from Passover to Pentecost over seven weeks. But Leviticus 25, it's called the redemption of property. This is where it lays out from 23 to about um, 28, if you want to read that. But it says in 25, 23 of Leviticus, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. Okay, you might be thinking, um, what? Because we don't have this. We don't have that you come to my house and I'm like, do you want to buy my house? And you're like, oh yeah, um, but I don't want your curtains because they're from 1990. And I'm like, I rent this place. I can't help it. No. Um, but you say you want to buy my house. So I say yes. And we write up a deed. Okay. We say you now own this house and land. And I roll it up. But on the outside of it, I put a provision. The law of redemption on the outside. And it says, if I can ever get the money or any of my sons can get the money to come back, you have to sell it back because it's mine. All right. God says, out of all the earth, this is the only area of the earth that God says in the word, the land is mine. We should take note when this happens, when God speaks like this, because he's not saying Georgia is mine, right? Like, or Alabama, which I personally think God loves, right? Um, he's not like stake and claim to that. So one is, I would like you to ask the question, which I'm not going to answer for you, um, 
but ask, why is this land so important to God? What started there and what ends there? That's a good question to ask yourself and to go research. Um, two is, out of all the earth, why does God only climb that? When he really built it all, but he claims that land, he says, it's mine. So when you understand the tribes of Israel, realize that there were 12 tribes, but Joseph's sons, when um, he is dying and his um, grand, their grandfather places his hands on both of their, both of them. And Joseph tries to say, no, no, here's the older one. He goes, nah, -uh. and he blesses both of them. There now become 13 tribes, but God's math always works out because there are 12 tribes, but the Levites, the tribe of Levi, are the priests. They can't own land. They don't get the land. And so Ephraim gets the land, the 13th. Got it? See, God's math all works out because the priests um, have their inheritance in the temple in God. So you see that God is working out this land. If there are several things, so let's say you can always get, then they even in Numbers, the last book of Numbers, I think it's, is it 26, no, 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 Numbers 36. Go look it up if it interests you. <clears throat> um, that's Numbers 36. It even becomes an issue because they're thinking, well, I'll marry old Callie Jane there. And then I'll get her daddy's land, or as my good friend Sheila would say, daddy. I love when Sheila talks. She's got the best Southern accent you've ever heard. And she says, my daddy. It's great. So if if they marry Sheila and they're like, I want her daddy's, her daddy's land, that doesn't work. And that's what Numbers 36 is about. Moses realizes there's a problem with the tribe of Joseph. And he comes back and says, hey, you can't have the land just because you marry her. It still stays with the original tribe. Then comes in this thing called the year of Jubilee. Let's say your, your granddad lost the land and you can't, you haven't been able to redeem it. You don't have the money to bring that sucker back. And so 50 years go by, 49 years, and the year of Jubilee comes in. Guess what? It goes back to the original. No matter if your granddaddy bought it or not, it's going back to whoever owned it originally. Every year of Jubilee, the land is returned. Now, at this point, you're thinking, why is any of this important? <laughs> I want to tell you, it is gravely important to this story because Naomi is going to be brought back in. She leaves and clearly Elimelech lost the land. He either sold it or whatever, we don't know. But when she gets back, she doesn't have land. They're nothing, they're destitute. And she needs a kinsman redeemer, a goel, G-O-E-L, to redeem it for her. But she doesn't think she has one until we find, until Ruth meets Boaz and brings um, Naomi to meet Boaz. It's Ruth. Catch that. Catch that and really think on what that means. So we see this here. Jump with me though quickly to Revelation 5 because we have said that you can't understand Revelation 5 until you understand Ruth. And you might be thinking, why is that? Well, guess what I'm going to tell you? <laughs> um, realize that the book of Revelation that we talked about, one through four, um, is continuation talking to the church. Because from about Acts 2 or Acts 10, depending on where you see that, until Revelation 4, this is written towards the church. Now, it also is written towards the Jews who are inside the church. So it's both together because once you come into the church, there is no Jew and a Gentile. But after Revelation 4... Starting in Revelation 5 on, it becomes a Jewish book again. Remember, it's a Jewish book from the call of Abram up until Acts 2. And it becomes Jewish again in thought, in word, and in deed. Catch that. Very, I'm punny today, y'all. I'm punny. So start in Revelation 5. The church has already been, um, the hapatso or the rapture has already occurred. Um, and so we're in Revelation 5. And we're in heaven, which on. Then I saw at the right hand of him who was seated at the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Stop right there. 
This is a deed. Realize that sealed within inside and outside, it is a deed. Um, it would have had the provision of, of redeeming written on the outside. This scroll has seven seals, the number of perfection on it. So we're seeing a deed being handed out. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its vessels? And no one in heaven or on earth was able, or no one in heaven, catch this, um, or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So let's just kind of take this apart for a minute. It's a deed that's being handed over. And John begins to weep. Because no one can open it. The word no one there is udas, O-U-D-E-I-S in the Greek. Udas, it means nothing. No one. Like it's a vast concept. Realize he's saying no one in heaven or earth could do it. And I love that he says on earth or under the earth. You needed someone who had conquered all of these things. Who had been, who is God, who had been man a kinsman redeemer of Adam and someone who had been under the earth who had conquered death. That's the requirement to open this deed. Do you see the beautiful picture that's being laid out here? And John is weeping because he's saying, if this deed is not open, then the seven seals do not open. Then the um, seven trumpets do not bowl. I mean, blow. Then the seven bowls are not poured out. Like, He's weeping because then it will never end. The final beauty of this will never come. The completeness will never fully be realized. Who can open this? And an elder of the church says to him, weep no more. There's a lion in the tribe of Judah. Praise God. There is a root of David and Isaiah 10 tells us who that root of David is. He's conquered so he can open the seal because hear me in this land of redemption thing, a deed to the land. Jesus had already purchased everything. He owns that land. So it doesn't matter who was usurping at the time when Revelation 5 happens. It does not matter if the Antichrist is roaring like a lion to intimidate and to try to be a beast to um, impersonate Jesus or if the false prophet is speaking or if Satan himself is standing on this earth. He, this land has already been purchased the one who can open the deed that says, I own it originally and all that is within it. So you cannot stop me as I open this and I redeem back to me that which is already mine. And we see here in Revelation 5, what is already his? Ruth, the bride. He is coming for her, but it's also a redemption of the land. It's a beautiful picture. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Jesus was standing there, the lamb. To a Jewish mind, this is very important. It's as though it's already been slain. It's already been cut to pieces to use as an offering. It's already been poured out because he already has done this thing. He owns the deed to us all. Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. Remember that seven is completion and the Holy Spirit, if you can just picture this, is on the lamb. It's over the lamb of Jesus Christ. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Jesus, Jesus took it from God. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, which represents the church, 24, fell down at the lamb, each holding a carp and a golden bowl of incense, which are prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll 
You're the only one that's worthy. And to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you have ransomed the people for God. You see, he already paid for this. He already has the deed. He's made the provisions within and without of this scroll that he has redeemed already. And the second time he comes, he's coming for us. He's coming for his bride. He's coming to redeem um, Ruth and Naomi in this picture, as we'll see all as the rest of the story. Um, go to seven, Revelation seven. This is about redeeming Naomi as well. And then you see the kingdom being set up. Where is it set up? On that land. Realize this picture is so big. Jump with me to Matthew because I want to show you this part where Matthew 13, where Jesus actually tells a parable um, about this. Matthew 13 is known as the seven parables. It is a transition period in Jesus's ministry when he only speaks from 13 on. He only speaks in parables to reveal the truth to the disciples. Um, to the disciples in private, but to the masses, he only speaks in parables. Why? Because for those who have ears to hear, they will hear, just like the book of Revelation. These parallel. But jump to the parable of hidden treasure for me. This is Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then his joy goes and sells all that he has to buy this field. I want to tell you, who is the man in this, this verse? The man is the word of God who came down and dwelt among men so that he would be able to open the seal. Hear me in this. God came to earth as man because he was coming to buy the whole field. He was coming to get the deed to it all. And why did he buy the field? Because there's treasure hidden in it. He died to own and have authority over everything. For every man, he laid his life down. For every one who has ever taken a breath of, of life or even in the womb for the first moment that life was in the womb, he laid upon that cross to buy the field because in the end, he comes back to get the treasure. Do you see the picture? That's why he can open the deed. That's why when John was weeping and said, there's no one that can open it. Here in walked the lamb who was slain. And God handed him the deed. It's so beautiful. And the Holy Spirit rested upon him. And they broke down singing a new song because it all suddenly made sense everything that was happening. The story of Ruth and Naomi is that deep. It goes that far. 1948 was when they came in being called Mara. And when the, Jew, the Nazis told the Jews, you're dying because you killed God. It's the irony is deep because every single one of us that has ever breathed killed God. He died because of our sin. He died willingly so that all of us could have life, that we would come to the house of bread and have life. So then you see this last part, and I'm wrapping up here. At 15, we're back in the book of Ruth, chapter 115. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. See, Orpah gave some lip service. She might have said a little prayer in fifth grade at a church I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, make you get angry, but she gave some lip service, but it wasn't true um, change and transformation. And I'll tell you how you know in this, because she turned back to her old gods. She went home. She didn't stay. But then there's Ruth. And I want to read you this famous part of the book of Ruth. It's her declaration, her motto, her life verse, I guess you can call it. Her thing that I feel like should be stamped on a huge sign everywhere she walks. Um, the thing that makes Boaz, I'm going to be honest, love her. Um, and it says that in here. And I want to read it to you from this, though. This is salvation. If you wonder what is true salvation, how do I know I'm saved? Listen to Ruth being the church speaking 
I'm going to read this as if you're speaking it to God, not just to Naomi, but hear this. And if you're wondering what salvation is, hear that it is not a prayer spoken, that it's not actually in the Bible. It's not that when you pray a prayer one time and all is good and you can do nothing else, you can be Orpah and go off to your life and you can have security. That is not in this Bible. And every time I hear it, I keep thinking, where did you read that? Right? Like, where did you get that from? Because it's not what's in the gospel. This is what is in the gospel for salvation. And it is a beautiful picture. Ruth said, and this is verse 16, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. From where you go, I will go, Father. I'm, I'm introducing the Father. I want you to see it's like saying it to the Lord. For you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death parts us. That is the picture of salvation. When you come to know Jesus, this is what you say to him. Where you're going to send me, I'm going to go. Where you go, I will follow you. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Where you lay down, I'm going to lay down, God. Your people will be my people. Even though they're frustrating and goodness gracious, the church is annoying. I will not quit on her for she is the bride and you don't quit on her. You will be my God and where you die, I will die. I want to put in there, it's if you ask me to die. I will die for this. And there I will be buried. Salvation is about going back to what we were originally called to be. Salvation is not a moment when you're just like, boom, I said a prayer and I know Jesus. Salvation, as Jude says, is about contending with the faith. It is a lifestyle. It is the heart being totally transformed. It is not Orpa, who gives lip service in one moment, but when things get hard, when physically it is not going how she needs it to go, when she realizes the cost, as Bonhoeffer says, the great and massive cost that this gospel is going to take, she turns and returns to her gods and to her household because she's not staying. And I want to tell you that I think this is deep theology, that we cannot reside or rest our salvation upon something we did 10 years ago and think that that will float us through. For what kind of servant are we if we think that's what this takes? Do not get me wrong. Salvation is a gift freely given. Hear that. You cannot earn it. You can do nothing. Naomi and Ruth do nothing to earn what's about to happen to them. But they still had to walk this out with deep determination, contending to make it to the end. So I pray that as you hear this, that you will not be one who runs without knowing where you go, who fights the wind, but please be the church that we're called to be. Get on our faces, get on our knees, get in the scripture, contend for the faith, for it is harder and harder to stay true in the world that we live in. And yet God is saying, make it to the end. I am coming to redeem you back to me. I only, I already bought the field. I died on the cross. It is finished. Now live in it. Walk in it. Abide in me.